Partners. Um, today we're going to talk about the pharmacology of anticoagulant agents and antiplatelet agents. Okay, so we're going to start with an introduction to different disorders of hemostasis. Um, hemostasis is just the cessation of bleeding. So when you have some sort of an injury and a vessel breaks and blood is leaking out of that vessel, the body responds in multiple ways to try and decrease that blood loss. Um, <clears throat> we have vascular spasms, the platelets get sticky and form a platelet plug, and then coagulation occurs where the blood itself gets um, like thicker or it forms a blood clot. So all of that happens to decrease the amount of blood that we lose when a vessel breaks. Disorders of hemostasis can occur because of kind of two opposite um, issues. We can have um, thromboembolic disorders or we can have bleeding disorders. Um, <clears throat> thromboembolic disorders include when we have thrombosis occur. Um, thrombosis is the formation of a unwanted clot in a blood vessel. Um, formation of an unwanted clot or an unnecessary clot is the most common type of disorder related to hemostasis. So when we're talking about a disorder of hemostasis, normally we're talking about clots forming when we don't actually need them. Um, bleeding disorders are the opposite. With bleeding disorders, this involves a failure of hemostasis. So in this case, the body is actually not able to you know, form clots or, or not able to decrease the amount of bleeding that's current. Um, these are much more rare. So um, let's talk about, about the thromboembolic disorders first. So thromboembolic disorders, um, again, include thrombosis, the formation of clots that are unnecessary. Um, we hear this word thrombus and, and embolus. Um, a thrombus is a clot that adheres to the vessel wall, right? So thrombus adheres, um, oops, sorry, that says atherosclerosis. Um, a thrombus adheres to the vessel wall. So the clot's not actually moving through um, the blood vessels at that point. It's stuck to the vessel wall and it's, it's kind of growing there. Um, when it breaks off from the vessel wall and it starts you know, traveling through the bloodstream, then we call it an embolus. Um, so as it travels you know, around the body through the blood vessels, that's an embolus that's occurring. Um, arterial thrombi normally occur in medium-sized arteries. Um, that are atherosclerotic. So arterial clots, uh, arterial thrombus, normally occur in medium-sized vessels that are atherosclerotic. So this means that arterial clots are normally um, clots that are very platelet-rich. Um, and we're going to kind of, the way that we look at clots is different if we're looking at a platelet-rich clot or if we're looking at a clot that's actually um, you know, blood clot, like coagulation occurring. Um, venous thrombi, um, venous thrombi are normally caused by blood stasis. So when the blood is not um, like flowing, when it, it's not flowing appropriately, when it kind of stays in one spot, um, or by inappropriate activation of clotting. Remember that Blood clotting is this whole um, like cascade of chemical reactions that occurs, and um, that blood cascade ends with the formation of fibrin. Um, and fibrin is insoluble in the blood. It's not. It doesn't dissolve in the blood. It's insoluble. So that's why the blood starts to thicken when we activate that clotting cascade. So venous thrombi. Right, thrombi that are um, like usually like in the deep veins, for example, a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis in the leg, that would usually be a fibrin-rich clot. 
And then again, clots that form in arteries because of atherosclerosis, those are normally going to be platelet-rich clots. Um, <clears throat> when we look at the specific disorders um, related to thromboembolic events, this includes things like acute MI, acute myocardial infarction. This would be when the um, when the clot blocks one of the coronary arteries, so we don't have enough blood flow going to the actual myocardium, the actual heart itself. Um, this could be DVT, deep vein thrombosis. This is when we have, again, normally a fibrin-rich clot that blocks one of the, um, the deep veins in the legs. These veins are responsible for draining blood from the legs back up to the heart. So if you block one of these veins, the blood can't drain from the leg. And we see blood start to accumulate in the leg and the leg normally um, swells. It gets swollen and red and hot and painful um, from all of that blood that's accumulated there. PE is pulmonary embolism. So this is when, again, an embolus is a, a clot that's flowing through the blood. Um, this is when the clot flows through the blood vessels um, and eventually it gets stuck in one of the small vessels in the lungs. Um, so then obviously weren't blood's not flowing through the lungs appropriately. That's normally very painful um, and there's a decrease in the ability to oxygenate the blood. And then finally, um, acute ischemic stroke. This is when the clot, or sometimes it's called a thrombotic stroke, um, <clears throat> this is when the, the clot is blocking a blood vessel that goes to the brain. Again, we have, uh, you know, a clot that gets stuck in one of the really small vessels going to the brain. So that part of the brain is no longer receiving blood flow. So it's ischemic. Um, ischemia remembers when there's not enough there's not enough blood perfusion through that tissue. So that tissue becomes oxygen starved. Um, and we know that of course that can end up causing cell death and damage in that part of the brain. Bleeding disorders, um, <clears throat> again, are much more rare. We're not really gonna focus on bleeding disorders in this lecture. <clears throat> Bleeding disorders include things like hemophilia. Um, hemophilia is treated with transfusions of recombinant factor eight um, because that's what hemophilia is. Hemophilia is a deficiency. It's an inherited condition um, and it's a deficiency in um, factor eight, which is one of the factors that's necessary for blood clotting. Remember we said blood clotting occurred because of a cascade of chemical reactions, um, where one chemical reaction activates an enzyme that makes the next reaction occur. That activates an enzyme that makes the next reaction occur. And eventually we convert fibrinogen into fibrin. And again, fibrin is not soluble, so the blood thickens. That's blood clotting. Um, if you're missing one of those factors, um, those factors are the things that are necessary to make the chemical reactions go. So if you're missing one of those factors, it, it slows down or hampers your ability to produce fibrin. That's the problem with hemophilia. So we transfuse them with blood that has factor eight. So we're replenishing what they don't have. Vitamin K deficiency is treated with just supplementing vitamin K. Um, vitamin K is necessary to make multiple clotting factors. So if the person is deficient in vitamin K, then they're not able to make some of their clotting factors, so they don't clot appropriately. Um, we just replace that vitamin K and that takes care of the problem. Um, von Willebrand disease. Um, von Willebrand disease is treated with um, DDAVP. Um, DDAVP is just desmopressin. Um, if we have a little bit time of time later when we talk about platelets, I'll talk more about von Willebrand disease. Okay, so first we're going to talk a bit about um, platelets and the way that platelets function. Um, and then we'll be able to talk about some drugs that are responsible for decreasing platelet activation and aggregation. First off, platelets are present in your bloodstream. 
right? Platelets or thrombocytes are, you know, flowing through the bloodstream all the time. Um, and those platelets that are flowing through the bloodstream in a normal, healthy individual are what we refer to as resting platelets. They are not activated. Because they're not activated, they don't, um, they don't aggregate. Um, <clears throat> they don't attach to vessel walls. They don't stick to each other. They don't form clumps. They simply flow through the bloodstream nicely. If platelets get activated, then they start to attach to the vessel wall and to each other and they form a big clump. That's not a normal state. So the reason that when everything is normal and healthy and, and functioning well, the reason that platelets do not get activated or aggregated um, is because healthy endothelial cells release a compound called prostacycline. So as long as our, remember endothelial cells are the cells that line our blood vessels. So as long as the blood vessel wall is healthy and our endothelial cells are healthy, they're going to be releasing prostacycline. That prostacycline goes into the blood and it binds to receptors on platelets. So when the prostacycline binds to the platelets, there's you know, a whole chemical reaction that happens inside the platelets. Um, we have an increase in, an increase in CAMP, cyclic AMP. Um, that increase in cyclic AMP causes a decrease in calcium, and that decrease in calcium is what's you know, preventing or making sure that platelets don't get activated and they don't start to aggregate or stick to each other. So kind of the point here is as long as platelets are healthy, I'm sorry, as long as endothelial cells are healthy, they release prostacycline and that prevents the platelets from becoming activated and sticking to each other. So we said platelets have receptors that bind to prostacycline and that prevents activation. Platelets also have receptors that bind to thrombin um, and thromboxanes, as well as collagen. Those do the opposite. Um, if we have thrombin or thromboxanes or collagen, um, the binding of those actually triggers platelet activation and aggregation. So if those things were present, if we had a lot of those things present, then platelets would start to um, attach to vessel walls and stick to each other. In the absence of injury, so like when again, when the vessel wall is healthy and there's no injury, the amount of thrombin and thromboxane that we have is very low. Like those are just very low unless we have an injury occurring and blood clotting occurring. Um, also, the amount of collagen is low. Collagen is not exposed. Um, collagen is in the vessel wall. Collagen um, is like substructure, right? It's a protein that provides substructure in the vessel wall. So as long as the vessel wall is intact, that's not exposed. Um, but if the vessel wall gets broken, then the collagen get ex gets exposed. And that exposed collagen binds to the platelets, and that's how the platelet um, gets activated and attaches to the vessel wall. So as long as the vessel is healthy, we don't have thrombin, thromboxane, or exposed collagen. So platelet activation and aggregation are not um, initiated. They don't occur. Okay, so here we're gonna look at the platelet response to injury. Um, so like what actually happens to activate our platelets? Sorry, I'm, I brought students to a conference. So I'm in Washington, DC, and my daughter is, it's like 6 a.m. My daughter's sleeping in the hotel room, so I'm out in the hallway so I don't wake her up. So that's why my surroundings are what they are. Um, trying to get situated so I don't shake the screen too much. Okay, so the platelet response to injury. When endothelial cells are not healthy, so for example, when atherosclerosis is present, um, which remember when there's too much cholesterol, um, when we have really high LDL cholesterol and triglycerides and 
um, dyslipidemia or hypercholesterolemia is present, atherosclerosis starts to occur. We get these, these plaques that build up on the vessel walls. Well, and there's this like inflammatory response that happens. The vessel wall is not healthy in that case. So the endothelial cells that are lining the vessel are not healthy. Um, so when there's atherosclerosis, and the vessel wall is not healthy, the endothelial cells are not able to make as much prostacycline. So the amount of prostacycline that's being released goes down. Remember, prostacycline was there um, to bind to receptors on um, the platelets, and when it binds to its, so here you see prostacycline um, from the endothelial cell, it's supposed to bind to receptors on the platelet and um, you know, increase CAMP, and, um, which decreases calcium. Here, endothelial cells are not healthy, so they're not producing as much prostacycline, which means they're not able to increase cyclic A and P. Um, and as a result, we start to see the amount of calcium inside the platelet increase. Um, that increase in calcium activates the platelets. Then platelets can aggregate, they start to get sticky, and they form big platelet-rich clots. Um, also, when thrombin or collagen bind to um, receptors on the platelets, the platelets release their granules, right, triggering this, um, you know, activation and aggregation process. Um, here you can see the platelets adhering to the exposed collagen, um, and then they release their granules to attract more platelets. So, like when one platelet becomes activated, it releases its granules, and those activate all of the other platelets in the area they release their granules and they activate all of the other platelets in the area. And it's this like, um, you know, exponential increase in the amount of platelets that are activated and then they all become sticky and they aggregate and attach to each other. Okay, so thus far we said that platelets were activated um, and the platelets that are activated have decreased CAMP and they have increased calcium. Um, and we said that that increase in calcium causes them to release their granules um, and that their granules activate other platelets. Um, their granules have things like platelet activating factor, um, serotonin, thrombin, ADP, um, adenosine diphosphate. Um, and these are mediators that, you know, go out into the blood and activate other platelets that are nearby to, you know, recruit them into um, the aggregating platelets. So <clears throat> here at the very bottom, this is really important um, because this affects the way that, you know, some of the drugs that we use. Um, the decreased cyclic AMP and the increase in calcium inside the platelets also activates what we call um, the glycoprotein 2B3A. Three, um, three receptor on the surface of the platelets. Right? So glycoprotein 2B3A receptor on the surface of the platelets gets activated. Um, this receptor binds to fibrinogen. Um, remember, fibrinogen is already present in the bloodstream, right? There's always fibrinogen in the bloodstream. Um, so this receptor binds to fibrinogen. The fibrinogen can bind to multiple glycoprotein receptors. So one fibrinogen binds to, here you see it happening here, one fibrinogen binds to receptors on both of these platelets, so it links the platelets together, um, cross-links the platelets. That's what the actual aggregation is. So when the platelet is activated and this glycoprotein 2B3A receptor gets activated, that's like the actual physical means for the platelets sticking to each other. So instead of having platelets free-flowing nicely through the bloodstream, 
they all start to stick to each other and you get a clump, right? Or you get a mass platelet-rich clot. Okay, so now we know how platelets get activated and how platelets aggregate. Um, so we're going to talk about drugs that are considered platelet aggregation inhibitors. So drugs that prevent um, platelet aggregation or they decrease platelets sticking to each other to decrease the formation of a platelet-rich clot. So these would be effective, for example, in patients who have um, a lot of atherosclerosis and you're worried about arterial clots forming because of this atherosclerosis. Um, <clears throat> there are multiple different drugs here, like multiple different classes that work differently. For example, we have drugs that work by inhibiting COX-1. Um, COX is cyclooxygenase. Um, we have cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2 that we're normally looking at. Um, in this case, inhibiting COX-1 or cyclooxygenase 1 helps to inhibit platelet aggregation because COX-1 is um, it's an enzyme that's needed for platelets to synthesize thromboxane. Um, so if you inhibit COX-1, the platelet can't synthesize um, thromboxane. Specifically, it's thromboxane A2. Um, and thromboxane A2 promotes platelet aggregation. Um, <clears throat> so without that, it decreases aggregation. We also have agents that block that glycoprotein 2B3A receptor. Remember, we said fibrinogen binds to that receptor. Here you can see um, how fibrinogen binds to receptors on multiple platelets. So the platelets all get stuck together um, when fibrinogen binds to that, that GP2B3A receptor. If we block the receptor, we block that aggregation from occurring. Um, <clears throat> we also have drugs that block ADP receptors. Um, and again, remember, ADP promotes aggregation. So if we block the ability of ADP to bind to that receptor, we block some of that aggregation. Um, so what do we use these, these platelet aggregation inhibitors for? Um, they can be used for the prevention or treatment of cardio-occlusive diseases, um, the maintenance of vascular grafts and arterial patency, um, and as adjuncts to thrombin inhibitors or thrombolytics in myocardial infarction. We'll talk about this more specifically as we go. Okay, so we're going to start by talking about aspirin. Aspirin, I think, seems like kind of a basic drug. It's available over the counter. It's been around forever. It's super cheap, but aspirin is a very important agent um, when it comes to you know, the, the treatment or prevention of platelet-rich clots. Um, it's very effective. It's very important. So aspirin inhibits COX-1, inhibits cyclooxygenase 1, which prevents the formation of thromboxane A2, which results in a um, suppression of platelet aggregation. Now, when we look at aspirin, aspirin re, um, inhibits COX-1 irreversibly. So once aspirin binds to the COX-1 enzyme, it does not detach, like that's it. Um, it is completely um, ineffective. So what this means is that aspirin suppresses platelet aggregation for the life of the platelet. So even if the aspirin gets cleared from the body, say that the aspirin is cleared from the body, um, you know, within a few hours, it's gone, it's still working. Like that aspirin continues to work because that platelet is no longer going to work ever again. Like that platelet is now useless. Um, <clears throat> the life of the platelet is about seven to 10 days. So aspirin continues working for seven to 10 days. Um, repeated, now obviously taking aspirin once doesn't get rid of all of your platelets, right? Like, or it doesn't inactivate all of your platelets. Some of them are still working. However, when we give aspirin repeatedly, 
um, it has a cumulative effect, inhibiting more and more and more platelets. Um, so eventually, you you know you're aiming for this complete inhibition of platelets. Um, <clears throat> complete inhibition of platelets occurs at a relatively low dose compared to like doses of aspirin that we would use for pain, for example. Um, complete inhibition of platelets occurs with 75 milligrams daily. Seventy-five milligrams daily um, will cause complete inhibition of platelets for the life of the platelet. Um, aspirin is used um, can be used prophylactically um, in ischemic conditions. Um, so we see it used for prophylactically and um, transient cerebral ischemia. Um, we see aspirin used in myocardial infarction, um, or MI. It can be used to reduce recurrence of MI, um, like post-MI. After a patient has a myocardial infarction, um, they then take daily aspirin afterwards um, in order to decrease the likelihood of having a second MI. Um, it also decreases mortality um, in primary and secondary um, prevention of myocardial infarction. So it decreases recurrence and it decreases mortality in myocardial infarction. Um, so you'll hear like when a patient's having chest pain, um, you know, if they're having chest pain, they think they're having a heart attack and they call 911, we have them take a aspirin, like chew an aspirin um, right then because that does decrease mortality. Um, the, the normal use when we're talking about, um, or the normal dose when we're talking about platelet aggregation is between 50 milligrams and 325 milligrams daily. Remember we said it takes 75 milligrams daily for complete inhibition of platelets to occur though. So typically what we'll see is that we recommend low dose aspirin for patients to take on a daily basis. That low dose aspirin is an 81 milligram aspirin. Um, we used to call this baby aspirin, like for decades, we referred to this as baby aspirin, but that was confusing and some patients thought this was actually for use in babies and it's not for use in babies. So now um, we've, we've made a concerted effort to refer to this more appropriately as low dose aspirin instead. So let's look at the kinetics of aspirin. Um, aspirin comes in multiple forms. The two kind of major things that we would recommend to patients are to take either enteric coated aspirin or chewable aspirin. And which one you take depends on what you're using it for at the time. Um, enteric coated aspirin protects the stomach. Um, aspirin can, uh, you know, can be harmful for the stomach. It can increase the likelihood of um, ulcers developing in the stomach. So if you give enteric coated aspirin, it has a coating in it that stops it from dissolving in the stomach. And instead, it just goes through the stomach and it dissolves in the intestines. Um, so if a patient is taking the aspirin daily for prevention, so if they're taking it daily to, you know, prophylactically to prevent some sort of ischemic attack from occurring, um, then they should take you know, 81 milligram enteric coated aspirin daily. If they are taking it in an acute situation, like in an emergent situation, if they feel chest pain, they think they're having a heart attack and they're waiting for the ambulance to come get them, they should take chewable aspirin. Um, and that's just because the chewable aspirin is the fastest absorbed. If you have to wait for it to get to the intestines before it's gonna be absorbed, that takes a lot longer but chewable gets absorbed very rapidly um, or more rapidly. So that is preferable in emergency, um, in emergency situations. Um, aspirin is metabolized to salicylic acid in the liver. Um, and salicylic acid is actually um, also effective as a COX inhibitor. So the half-life of aspirin is very, very short. The half-life of the actual aspirin is like 15 to 20 minutes. Um, 
but the salicylic acid has a half-life of between 3 and 12 hours. I understand that's a huge range, um, but the salicylic acid has a longer half-life, so you do actually get a longer um, you know, duration of action than it would appear if you looked at the half-life of, of just aspirin. Um, okay. Um, immediate release aspirin um, must be separated from any other type of NSAID that the patient is taking. Um, NSAID, that's non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Um, so that's something like ibuprofen or naproxen. These are usually taken for pain and inflammation um, or possibly for fever. So the reason, um, so aspirin should be taken 60 minutes before the NSAID or eight hours after the NSAID. Um, the reason for this is that NSAIDs also bind to COX-1. Um, they also inhibit the COX-1 enzyme. The difference is that the NSAIDs like ibuprofen only inhibit COX-1 temporarily. So um, they're gonna compete with the aspirin for the same binding site. So that means aspirin's not gonna be able to inhibit as many platelets. And um, the platelets that are inhibited by the you know, ibuprofen or the naproxen are only going to be inhibited for a short period of time and then they're going to reactivate again. So um, you have to make sure that you allow the aspirin to bind to all the platelets and completely inhibit them for life before you give the naproxen. Otherwise, if you give them at the same time, the NSAID will decrease the effectiveness of the aspirin. Um, so adverse drug effects of aspirin tend to occur more at higher doses. Um, the doses that we're using for the platelet um, aggregation inhibition are really low doses. Um, so we don't see as many adverse drug effects at these low doses as we would see if someone, you know, say we're taking it like at a higher dose around the clock for pain. Um, we can see some prolonged bleeding time, which makes sense. We're inhibiting platelets, um, so that can interfere with bleeding. Um, prolonged bleeding time can be associated with, um, you know, hemorrhagic stroke. There's an injury um, or GI bleeding, for example. Um, angioedema is possible, um, bronchospasm possible. Uh, we can see some GI disturbances, again, increase in things like um, gastric ulcers. Um, Rye syndrome is possible. So Rye syndrome is associated with cerebral edema and liver damage, um, agitation, personality um, changes, and Rye syndrome is really serious because it can end up progressing to coma or death. Typically, Rye syndrome is seen in children between six months and 15 years of age after they've had a virus. There's an increased chance of developing Rye syndrome if aspirin is given. So we never give aspirin to children when they have a virus. Um, never, regardless of what it's for. Um, <clears throat> Technically, aspirin is approved for use in children over three years old. However, if we're treating pain or fever, the recommendation is to give either Tylenol or um, a different, like ibuprofen. So if you're treating pain in a child, if you're treating fever in a child, we don't give aspirin. We give acetaminophen, um, acetaminophen is Tylenol, um, or ibuprofen. The only reason we would give aspirin to a child is for its antiplatelet effect. Um, and again, never if they have a cold or a flu, um, or even if they've just gotten like the chicken pox vaccine. Um, we do not give a child aspirin then. Um, Stephen jo um, SJS is Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Stevens-Johnson syndrome is a rare but serious disorder of the skin and mucous membranes. Um, it's usually a reaction to a medication or infection. Um, often, um, SJS begins with kind of like flu-like symptoms, you know, achiness and malaise. 
um, followed by a painful red or purplish rash that spreads. Um, it spreads over the body and blisters. And it's, it's almost like the skin is actually peeling off. It's, it's a very serious um, reaction. Again, also a very rare reaction. Okay, so aspirin is a COX-1 inhibitor. Now we're gonna talk about P2Y12 receptor antagonists. Um, there are multiple of these listed down here at the bottom. Most commonly used are probably clopidogrel, which that's Plavix, that was the first one around. Um, clopidogrel, um, prasugrel, and ticagrelor. Um, <clears throat> these obviously block the P2Y12 receptor. Um, the P2Y12 receptor is the receptor that ADP binds to. So these work by blocking ADP from binding to its receptor. Um, as you can see here, um, ADP is one of the signaling molecules that stimulates platelets to release calcium which you guys know, an increase in calcium is what activates the glycoprotein 2B3A receptor. So here you can see normally ADP binds to its receptor that increases calcium and calcium activates this glycoprotein 2B3A receptor. You guys know fibrinogen binds to that receptor and that causes aggregation of platelets. So this prevents ADP from activating this receptor, so it prevents the activation of the glycoprotein 2B3A receptor, preventing aggregation of platelets. Okay, so um, these are used as dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin. Um, so patients take, can, um, can use both, like clopidogrel and aspirin. Um, <clears throat> so clopidogrel, is used for prevention of atherosclerotic events in patients with previous MI, um, stroke, or peripheral artery disease. Um, it can also be used for prophylaxis of thrombotic events in patients who are experiencing acute coronary syndromes. So um, an acute coronary syndrome, for example, like unstable angina, so that's like chest pain that's that's worsening, it's, it's increasing and worsening, and it's, it's not going away when the person takes their nitroglycerin. Um, or in NSTEMI, that's um, non-ST elevated myocardial infarction. Um, so some sort of an acute coronary syndrome occurring. Um, also, they can be used in, or clopidogrel can also be used for PCI. Um, PCI is percutaneous coronary intervention um, with or without stinting. Um, also, up top here, cangrelor um, can also be used during um, PCI to decrease, um, can be used as an adjunct during PCI to decrease thrombotic events um, in select patients. Um, <clears throat> uh, Ticlopidine, I don't have ticlopidine listed here itself, but ticlopidine is similar to clopidogrel, um, but it is associated with severe um, hematologic reactions. So it is only used when other agents aren't tolerated. Um, so clopidogrel would be preferred, um, like that would be your first choice. Ticlopidine is not used as much because of adverse drug events. Um, so prasugrel, um, prasugrel is used to decrease thrombotic cardiovascular events in patients with acute coronary syndrome um, undergoing PCI. So again, acute coronary syndromes include things like unstable angina um, or non-ST elevated myocardial infarction. Um, also in STEMI, so in ST-elevated myocardial infarction. Um, again, patients with these acute coronary syndromes who are undergoing PCI. Um, one thing that's important is prasugrel is contraindicated 
in patients with a history of uh, TIA, transient ischemic attacks, or stroke. Um, we don't have that, that same contraindication with clopidogrel. Um, <clears throat> Ticagrelor, um, Ticagrelor is used for the prevention of thromboembolism um, in patients with um, unstable angina or acute MI. Again, STEMI um, um, and, and STEMI. Okay, um, <clears throat> there are some important kinetic issues with these agents. Um, first off, they require oral loading doses um, <clears throat> because they can take a while to get up to their effective um, concentrations, except for Cangrelor. Um, Cangrelor is an IV agent um, that does not require an oral, um, or does not require an oral loading dose. The other ones require their oral loading doses. Um, <clears throat> this is very important. Clopidogrel is a prodrug. Remember, that means that the clopidogrel that they're taking is not active. It requires activation by CYP2C19. And we mentioned this in Form 1, um, that if your patient's taking clopidogrel, they have to avoid drugs that inhibit CYP2C19. Um, a couple big ones, important ones here that are really common are omeprazole and esomeprazole. These agents are over-the-counter agents um, that are PPIs, they're proton pump inhibitors that are very commonly used for um, like heartburn, right, for, for acid reflux or GERD. Um, and because they're over-the-counter and they're so commonly used, it's not unusual for a patient to be taking this when the doctor does not know that they're taking it or for them to be experiencing heartburn and to just go pick it up off the shelf. So you need to warn your patients about this. Um, every patient that takes clopidogrel should be told about um, the possible interactions that can occur. Otherwise, the patient will be taking the clopidogrel and it's not going to be activated to its active form, so it's going to be useless. And the problem is you can't feel that. There's no like way for you to sense that it's not working. Um, you know it's not working when the patient has another event, um, when they have some sort of a, um, you know, a, acute coronary syndrome or something like that. Um, so again, patients need to be counseled to avoid inhibitors like omeprazole. Um, also, an alternate needs to be used in poor metabolizers. Um, if your patient is a CYP2C19 poor metabolizer, then they need to use um, something besides clopidogrel. So they can use prasugrel um, or ticagrelor. Um, Prasugrel is also a prodrug, um, but it has varied activation. Um, so it's not, there's not a clinically significant interaction here because it can be activated by various different means, whereas clopidogrel relies completely on CYP2C19. Okay, adverse drug effects. Um, adverse drug effects include prolonged bleeding, and this is prolonged bleeding that there's no antidote for. Um, some other like anticoagulant agents um, or blood thinning type agents, we have antidotes for. So if the patient has a bleeding event or we've, we've you know, given them too much, we can back it up with the antidote. There's no antidote for these agents. Um, <clears throat> they carry a black box warning for bleeding events. Um, not clopidogrel. Clopidogrel doesn't have um, the black box warning on it, but the other agents carry a black box warning for bleeding agents. Um, <clears throat> and after they are stopped, um, after therapy is stopped, the platelet system requires time to recover. It's not like, you know, you immediately have your platelets active again. It requires time. Um, Prasugrel um, cannot be given in patients with a history of TIA or stroke or patients over 75 years old um, because of these bleeding events, specifically um, cerebral bleeds. Um, <clears throat> and a ticagrelor 
um, has decreased effectiveness with aspirin taken over 100 milligrams um, daily. And then also CYP3A4 interactions. Um, <clears throat> glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors include drugs like abcixumab, um, eptivibitide, and um, ticrofaban. So these agents bind to the glycoprotein 2B3A receptor on platelets, preventing fibrinogen from binding. Um, these are given as adjuncts with heparin, um, which we'll talk about later with coagulation, um, with heparin and aspirin during PCI. Um, so this is to prevent cardiac ischemic complications from occurring during the PCI, the percutaneous um, um, coronary intervention. Uh, these are given intravenously um, as an IV bolus followed by IV infusion. Uh, increased bleeding is seen if patients are also taking ginkgo biloba, um, SSRIs, which are selective serotonin receptor inhibitors, um, <clears throat> and also SNRIs, um, um, sorry, serotonin, norepinephrine reuptor, reuptake inhibitors. Sorry, for SSRI, I think I said receptor inhibitor, not reuptake inhibitor. Um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. These are um, drugs that are used for depression. Um, they're antidepressants, as well as things like um, you know, prevention of anxiety long-term and stuff like that. These like fluoxetine is a very common agent. Um, again, SNRI is um, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, and then other antiplatelet agents as well. Um, major adverse drug effect here that we see is bleeding. Okay, so just real quickly, the last couple agents that are platelet aggregation inhibitors, um, dipyridamol and silostazole. Um, these both inhibit phosphodiesterase enzymes. Um, dipyridamol inhibits phosphodiesterase in general to increase intracellular levels of CAMP, cyclic AMP, which we know um, is related to platelet aggregation. Um, typically, this is combined with aspirin. There's actually a combination tablet that has dipyridamol plus aspirin in it. Um, the dipyridamol and aspirin are used for stroke prevention in patients who've had previous um, ischemic stroke or TIA. Um, <clears throat> do not use this in unstable angina. Silostazole also inhibits phosphodiesterase. It's just phosphodiesterase type 3. Again, same impact. Um, this increases intracellular levels of CAMP or cyclic AMP. Salazazole is used to reduce the symptoms of intermittent claudication and is contraindicated in heart failure. So both of these agents, dipyridamol and salazazole, have vasodilation effects. So they both cause vasodilation. Um, <clears throat> so because they have cardiovascular effects, that's why we're seeing these uh, contraindications that are in cardiac conditions. Just kind of FYI. These are not... Um, super commonly used agents. Um, here, you guys um, can kind of look through this on your own. This is a nice summary of the different drugs uh, that are used. Um, here you see oral agents and then on the bottom, the injectable agents. I do want you guys to take a second to look at the recommended monitoring. Um, because there is recommended monitoring parameters for um, most of these agents. So take a second and kind of read through this slide on your own. Okay, so that's it for platelet aggregation. Remember, when we talk about hemostasis, um, the cessation of bleeding, there's kind of two major aspects. There's the platelet aspect and then there's the coagulation aspect. Um, and this is why when we look at clots, we have two major kind of classifications of clots. We have our platelet-rich clots, um, typically arterial clots, typically related to atherosclerosis, right? <clears throat> These are usually causing things like an MI or maybe a stroke. Um, we also have fibrin-rich clots. Um, these usually develop um, 
in veins, right, because of, for example, venous stasis or improper activation of the coagulation or clotting cascade. So now we're going to talk about that coagulation aspect. Um, <clears throat> Blood coagulation, um, remember, is a really kind of complex process where we have a bunch of cascade reactions. Um, so there's, there's you know, multiple pathways where we activate one enzyme and then that catalyzes a reaction that activates the next enzyme. That catalyzes a reaction that activates the next enzyme. Um, here, ultimately, um, the, the whole end result here is that we end up activating thrombin, and thrombin is the enzyme that converts fibrinogen into fibrin. Um, here you can see the two major pathways. We have the intrinsic pathway, which begins in the bloodstream, and the extrinsic pathway that begins in the vessel, like in the vessel wall. Um, <clears throat> again, various of our clotting factors get activated and they're activating, um, you know, one activates the next, which activates the next. Both the intrinsic pathway, which is assisted by like platelet activating factor, and the extrinsic pathway, which is, um, which is assisted by tissue factor, both of those lead to the activation of factor 10A. When factor 10A um, is activated, that's prothrombinase. Prothrombinase converts prothrombin, which is not active, into thrombin, which is active. Thrombin is what comes down and activates fiber, converts fibrinogen into fibrin. Again, the fibrinogen is already in the blood, it's not soluble. Once it's converted into, I mean, it's already in the blood, it is soluble. Once the fibrinogen is converted into fibrin, that is not soluble any longer. Um, so this um, extrinsic pathway again begins um, like in the vessel and it's assisted by tissue factor. Um, so we kind of refer to that as like the tissue factor pathway. pathway. Um, <clears throat> And we have drugs that we'll refer to as a uh, like tissue factor inhibitor, for example. Um, so this is how coagulation occurs. As always, the body also has ways to um, inhibit this um, or kind of get rid of blood clots. So protein C, protein S, um, antithrombin 3 and tissue factor pathway inhibitor. Um, all of those inhibit coagulation factors. Some anticoagulants, like heparin, for example, work by activating these factors. Okay. Um, heparin, for example, works mostly by activating um, the antithrombin 3. Right, but our body has ways to stop this process. Um, and sometimes the drugs that we use work by activating those ways. Um, so this right here, 10 and 10A, that's just showing you here um, in this picture that A is telling you that it's activated. So like factor 10, that's inactive, 10A is activated. Okay, so we're gonna start by talking about the parenteral anticoagulants. Um, so anticoagulants that we inject either intravenously um, or subcutaneously. Um, and we'll start with heparin and low molecular weight heparins. Low molecular weight heparins include things, um, for example, like enoxaparin. Um, enoxaparin is the generic for Lovenox. This is pretty commonly used, um, and daltaparin. So enoxaparin, daltaparin, those are examples of low molecular weight heparins. And then we have heparin, which heparin is frequently referred to as unfractionated heparin because it has not been fractionated, it has not been broken up. Um, <clears throat> so heparin, the unfractionated heparin, is taken from porcine intestinal mucosa. 
So it's taken from the intestinal mucosa of a pig. Um, and it includes a mixture of molecules with a really, a really wide range of molecular weights. Um, so a bunch of molecules at all different molecular weights. It's unfractionated. It hasn't been separated into you know, different molecules. Low molecular weight heparins, again, like anoxaparin or daltaparin, um, these are heterogeneous compounds that are much smaller in size. Um, so you take that, that you know, big mix and you pull out specific compounds so that you have one drug that has all the same compound in it. Um, and again, it's been, heparin's been fractionated. It's much smaller now. Um, these agents, um, in general, um, heparins and low molecular weight heparins, um, limit the expansion of thrombi um, by preventing the activation of fibrinogen into fibrin. Um, they are very fast, they work very quickly, um, and they are very frequently used in like, acute situations um, to you know, stop the formation of thrombi that are occurring. Um, <clears throat> so kind of a comparison of of the two. Um, heparin binds to antithrombin 3 and inhibits um, thrombin and 10A. Um, low molecular weight heparin, uh, like anoxaparin, binds to antithrombin 3 and inhibits 10A. So let's talk about heparin first. Um, without heparin, Antithrombin-3 interacts very slowly with thrombin and 10A. Remember, antithrombin-3, this is one of our body's own ways that we stop the clotting process, right? So typically it's a very slow um, thing because what happens is, um, you know, clotting starts. And when we start clotting, we also start the process of stopping it. It's just that the formation of the clot is very fast. The reactions that stop the clot are very, very slow. So the idea is that by time this stopping of the clotting finishes, um, the vessel's been fixed and, and everything is done and we're ready to stop the clotting process. Um, what these agents do is they speed up this, this reaction so that we can stop the clotting faster. So without heparin, antithrombin-3 is very slowly interacting with thrombin and 10A. With heparin, the antithrombin-3 changes shape and it inhibits thrombin like a thousandfold, right? So it's got a much, much faster and greater inhibition of thrombin. And remember, thrombin is the enzyme that converts fibrinogen into fibrin. Um, so we inhibit that thrombin really, really quickly and we stop that formation of any more fibrin. Um, low molecular weight heparins don't inhibit thrombin as avidly. Um, mostly they inhibit 10A. Um, so they still bind to antithrombin 3 and they still increase the, the, the activity of antithrombin 3. Um, but again, it's mostly inhibiting 10A. Remember, 10A is higher up in the cascade, right? Like when we were looking at the cascade, when we activate 10A, that's um, prothrombinase. Prothrombinase um, converts prothrombin into thrombin, and then thrombin goes down and converts fibrinogen into fibrin. So heparin is preventing both of those. It's, it's deactivating um, prothrombinase and it's deactivating thrombin. Um, low molecular weight heparins don't work on thrombin very much. They're mostly just stopping the prothrombinase from converting more thrombin. Um, so we stop making more thrombin, but we don't inactivate the thrombin that already exists when we look at um, anoxaparin.